All right, good afternoon, everyone. I uh, hope you had a great weekend. Um, today is the 1st of February, so we have our first exam coming up next Thursday. Um, and it uh, should cover all the material that we do this week, but it will not cover anything we cover next week. So whatever we cover on Tuesday will not be on Thursday's exam. So we'll talk more, I guess, when we end class Thursday, we'll know exactly you know, where we are in the class. Um, we're gonna start with a quiz today. It's a group quiz. So I'm gonna put you in breakout rooms and then you're gonna answer, you're gonna get your answers and then you're gonna come back and, and uh, do a poll question, just like we did with the last quiz. So um, take a moment to copy the, the problems down or take a screenshot or take a picture with your phone of the questions. And then I'm gonna go ahead and just do like random breakout rooms. And I'll put, uh, there'll be about three or four of you in each room and just talk about them. I'm gonna give you 10 minutes, that's it, all right? So the rooms are created, you should get an invitation. Go ahead and join the room after you've got the questions uh, copied down. And uh, I'll see you in 10 minutes. Chloe, are you there?
Okay, I've put the poll up. I'm not gonna answer any questions yet. I just wanna see what y'all got. Still waiting on three or four people. Okay, I think that's it. Everyone got their answers in? All right. Okay, so that was interesting. I, I jumped through um, in and out of the breakout rooms just to see what was going on. And um, my timing might have been off, but I really only heard two rooms actually talking. Um, I'm not sure if I just was in there at the wrong time, but uh, I was really hoping that number two would get you talking. Um, so let's go through these real quick. Um, the correct answer to the first one is C, four. And you can do that by taking this limit as x goes to zero, splitting it into sine 4x over one times one over cosine 4x. Of course, I should state that in the beginning, when you plug in zero, you get zero divided by zero, right? Which is bad. So you've got to do something. Um, so you just kind of peel it all apart like this. And then you say, oh, well, wait a minute. The problem is really this division by zero here. But you can slide that underneath this. As long as you introduce a four, on the top and bottom and slide the four under here, then this thing will go to one. And then this will also, so this will go to one. This goes to um, one over cosine of zero, cosine of zero is one, so one over one is one. And then this no longer is a problem because the X has been you know, slid over to the other side. So that's really just a one. And the four here is gone. So you just have four here. So multiply across, you get four. All right, that's that first one. Now the second one, the correct answer here for this one is B. And uh, so 95% of you set, got the first one right. And 65% of you got the second one right. So let's talk about this. So let's say we're taking a limit, right? And it's important to understand we're talking about a limit here. So let's say I'm taking the limit, you know, whatever X is going to, who cares? Doesn't matter what it is. And we're doing a ratio. So we've got a fraction. And it's, I'm saying here that the numerator is heads to a fixed number, right? And that number is negative. So this is headed to some negative number, okay? I don't know what it is, but it's some negative number. So I'm just gonna make up a number, negative three, okay? There's a negative number, right? And simultaneously, the denominator heads to a very, 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 very small positive number, okay? So think about what's happening here. If we take a positive number, right, it's got to be positive and it's very small. So something like, I don't know, 0 0.00001. That's a very, very small positive number. If you do this, if, forget, the, forget the negative and positive for a minute, all right? Just do three divided by 0 0.00001. That would be a huge number, right? That'd be a very big number. So if you, take, if you take a number and divide it by a small number, you get a big number. The fact that the numerator is negative and the denominator is positive means that the ratio of these two numbers must be negative. So you have to have a negative number that's huge, which would be negative infinity. That's where it's headed. It's headed to negative infinity. Um, now, anyone want me to clarify that? Because five of you did D. So do you want me to talk about why it's not D and or have I, have I made it make sense? We're okay. I I did like negative infinity, but just if you can like um, remind us, like the, the last class you put like four five or four rules, like if it goes to the left, like it's more positive, but no, or whereas mm -hmm. it was like four rules. Hold on, I don't even remember. 
four rules. It's like the right and left and negative and positive infinitive, like. Well, you know what? I'm gonna go through all of this again right now today. Okay, so maybe as I go through it today, it'll, it'll make a little more sense now that we've had a little bit of time to, to think about it. Does that sound okay? Okay, so we are in 1.6, and I told you last class there are two parts to 1.6. The first part is called infinite limits, and the second part is called limits at infinity. So we still have not finished the infinite limits, and I'm almost going to kind of start us over on it. I'm just going to go a little faster. So the idea behind infinite limits is this. If we ever take a limit, okay, and again, we're taking a limit. This is... That means we're in calculus, right? This is not an algebra thing where I'm asking you to take two numbers and then divide them. Because if, if I just give you two numbers and ask you to divide them, you're gonna get a number as an answer, unless it's undefined, right? Unless you divide by zero. So in the limit, things are kind of in motion here. Things are going towards something. So if you take a limit and your numerator is headed to a fixed number, all right? When I say fixed, I mean anything but zero, okay? Because if we get zero on top and zero on the bottom, we already know that that's algebra, right? We gotta do algebra for that. But if we get a fixed number that's not zero on top and the bottom is headed to zero. So please understand when I write zero down here, I do not mean that it is zero. I mean that it's headed to zero, right? Headed to zero. Right? Anytime this happens, that you have a fixed number on top and the bottom heads to zero, there are only three possible outcomes, okay? There's only three things that can happen. This ratio is either headed to infinity or it's headed to negative infinity or the limit will not exist. Those are the only three things that can happen, all right? Now, which of those three it is depends on, we have to, we have to analyze it a little bit more. It's not enough to just know, oh, fixed over zero. Oh yeah, I know what the answer is. We have to analyze the problem a little bit deeper in order to figure out which of the three possibilities it is. Okay, go with me. Now, I decided, I, I've never done it this way. I'm gonna try it this way. I've decided to break it down into cases. Let's see how this goes. I, what I'm afraid about, the reason I'm afraid to do it this way is because I don't want you to be sitting there thinking, oh, remember he gave us case A, B, C, D, E, F. I don't want you to think about it that way. Okay, this is just to get us going. These cases will just give you all the different things you could run into. What I think it's more important is that you understand the concept of what's happening here in terms of the number sense, how numbers interact with each other within a ratio. So let's look at the first case. Let's say that we have a fixed number. Now I'm gonna explain what that means. Let me copy this. I have an example ready to go here. Uh, let me start a new page. I'm gonna take this, this first example here of case A. All right, so this first case, what this is saying, okay, this notation right here is saying is this. We're taking a limit, right? And what's happening is the top is headed to a fixed number that's positive. That little plus in the top right, I want you to think about that as, oh, it's headed to a fixed number, but it's a positive fixed number. And then the denominator is headed to what? Zero, right? It's headed to zero and it's always positive also. If that happens, your answer must be infinity, positive infinity. So here, let's do some examples. So let's try this first example A. Our limit is headed to five, okay, right? It's headed to five. What does the little negative sign mean in a limit? What does that mean? Coming from the left. We're coming from the left, okay? So the way to think about that is here's a number line. We are approaching the number five from the left side, right? That's what's happening here. And the question is, what happens if I do that for this ratio? So let's try just the direct substitution first. If I take the number five and plug it in here and here for X, let's see what we get. All right, so let's see who, let's see who I didn't call on last time. See, Christian, you there? I'm here. Okay, Christian, where's the numerator headed? If X is headed to five, where's the numerator headed? Um, to you say 
No, X is going to five, right? Mm -hmm. This number is headed to five. So what happens if that number, if I replace that with five and then add five, what do I get? Zero, I mean 10. 10, right? So that's 10, right? Okay, everyone got that? Okay, Christian, what about the denominator? Where's the denominator headed if I replace this X with five? Zero. Zero, right? It's headed to zero. Are you all with me? Does everyone see right now that in the limit, right? In the limit, we're getting a fixed number over zero, right? That's what's happening. We're getting fixed over zero. So then we go, oh, okay, fixed over zero means there's three possible answers. It's either infinity, negative infinity, or doesn't exist. Those are the three possibilities. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try and figure out if I can determine whether or not I'm headed to a fixed positive number or negative number, and then whether or not I'm headed to zero as a positive or a negative number. So let me continue. So 10, I hope you would agree, the top is a fixed positive number. Yes, that's fixed positive. 10 is a positive number. It's, it's fixed, right? It's just 10, right? So the top is fixed and positive. The denominator is headed to zero, right? It's headed to zero. The question I have to answer is whether or not this is a positive or a negative number. I have to figure that out. And the way to figure that out is to think about where we were approaching, right? We were approaching five from the left, weren't we? So the numbers that are getting plugged in are to the left of five. So a good example of a number that would be to the left of five would be like 4.999. Agreed? That's pretty close to five, right? Imagine plugging that in right here. Imagine taking that 4.999 and plugging it in here. You would have five minus 4.9999, right? Which would be a very small what? Positive. Positive, number. positive right? Five take away 4.999 would be a very small positive number. And if you if you picked a number that was even closer, right, 4.9999999999, something like that, and you plugged it in here, oops, you would still have five takeaway. That would be a really tiny positive number. You understand? So I can conclude. See, I'm not doing any algebra here. I'm not doing any factoring or conjugates or this is all about me analyzing and thinking about the numbers and what's happening, all right? So from this, I can now determine this positive or negative. I now know that this is headed to zero through positive. It's through positive numbers. It's a very small positive number. And so I know that the answer must be infinity because I have a positive divided by a positive and the only answer I could possibly get would be positive infinity. Make sense? We have to do more, but I mean, you catch the gist of it. It's, it's the direct substitution in the beginning, right? To figure out what's happening, recognizing that, that that's not zero over zero, right? So no algebra or anything, recognizing that it means that it's in one of those three cases because we have fixed over zero, and then trying to figure out what's happening on top and bottom in terms of the signs, positive or negative. Let's look at B. So let's see, uh, Kevin, you're up. So Kevin- Looking yeah, at B. Pardon me? Looking at B, right? Yeah, we're looking at B and we are approaching negative five from which side? We are approaching it from the right. Right, so I always like to just write this down. I always like to put the number on the number line, negative five, and then approaching from the right would be over here. Okay, let's just keep that in mind. Now, Kevin, just do direct substitution and tell me what form that of, of limit we have here. If you do negative five in for X, what would we get on top and bottom? We get uh, 25, negative 25 over zero. You were right the first time. Oh yeah, it's the negative, oh, yeah. so you get oh, yeah. positive 25. I remember right? now. Okay, and then on the bottom, what would you get? Zero. Zero, right? So right here, Kevin recognizes that we have a fixed, right? Positive, because 25 is positive. And then over, and then the only thing Kevin really needs to figure out now is whether or not we're approaching zero through positives or negatives. So what do you think, Kevin? What would be a good number to pick over here that would be good for us to kind of analyze. Be careful here. Um, 
negative uh, 4.999. There you go, 4.999. Be careful when you're on the negative side of the number line, right? You have to keep in mind, like, a lot, students will make the mistake and they'll say, they'll pick a number like uh, negative 5.1 or 5.01. No, that's the other side, okay? Because you're on the negative side of the x axis or uh, negative side of zero. Okay, so Kevin, keep going. You, you've got this negative 4.99. If you were to plug that in right there for that X, do five plus negative 4.99, what would you get? Um, you'd get a number close to negative uh, to zero. Okay, positive or negative though? Uh, positive. Positive, right? It would be a positive number. Mm -hmm. Bellamy, you're shaking your head now. Why would be positive if- Why? Like Okay, so just take this, right? And imagine taking five and adding to it the negative. Oh, you will always like add a, a smaller number. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, okay. So when you do this together, you're going to get a really small number, but it'll be positively 0. 0.0001 or something like that. All we care about here, see, look, everyone, we already know the denominator is going to zero, right? We already know that. The question is whether or not it's positive or negative. That's the big thing that we need to know. So by just picking like a test, point of test number, we can determine the sign. Got it? All right, that's case, case A. I think once, now that I've established case A, I think case B, C, and D, you'll understand what's happening here. On case B, if you're fixed on the top and negative, and the bottom's headed to zero, but also through negative numbers, then the ratio would have to be positive, so you get positive infinity. Or if you had fixed on the top but positive, but the bottom's headed to zero, but negative through negative numbers, then now your ratio is negative, so you get, have to get negative infinity. Does this make sense? You're really just checking the signs. If, if they're the same signs, positive and positive or negative and negative, the answer is infinity. If the signs are different, top and bottom, then your answer is negative infinity, okay? Now, case E and F has to do with the, the idea that in both the, both the examples I gave you, both of these limits were what we referred to a couple of uh, course classes ago as one-sided limits, meaning we're only coming into the number from one side, right? Like we were coming into five here from the left and we were coming into negative five from the right. Those are one-sided limits. We learned when we were learning about limits in notation, we said that if you ever take a limit, like if I say limit X approaches, let's say two, and I don't put a plus or minus there, that means you have to come in from both sides, right? You have to, you have to check both sides if there's not a plus or minus in the top right corner. So that's called a two-sided limit. So case E and F say this. Case E says in a two-sided limit, okay, that means we have to check both sides. If we get different infinities from the opposite sides, then the limit won't exist. So like, for example, if we're trying to come into two and let's say from the left side, we get infinity, but the right side, we get negative infinity, then the limit doesn't exist, all right? If the infinities we get are different from the, from the two different sides. And then case F says, well, if we do do a two-sided limit and both sides go to the same infinity, then the answer would be whatever that infinity is. We're gonna do examples of each of these, okay? But this is kind of a summary of everything. Let's go get into some more examples. All right, so let's do this one, case B. Let's just see what happens. So let's see who's up here. Jose, you there? Yes, right. sir, I'm here. Here we go. Okay, so Jose, first things first, let's just do a direct substitution. Tell me what you get when you try and let X go to five here. So you got a negative five on top? Negative five on top, good. Bottom? You get a zero. Zero, okay, so what we have here right now is the numerator is headed to what, Jose? The numerator is heading towards negative five or negative number negative five then, yeah a negative fixed number right a negative so fixed number a fixed negative number right and then over and you already told me it was headed to zero right mm -hmm. yes sir so jose the only thing that's left to to really determine then is what is whether the 
number on the denominator is um, approaching the negative or the positive. That's right. Are we approaching zero through positive or negative numbers? So to do that, Jose, I'm going to draw a number line. I'm going to put what we're approaching here, five. And we are approaching from which side here, Jose? Uh, from the right. From the right. So give me a number over here that we can check. So 5.1111. You can do 5.1. You can do 5.01. You can do 5.001, whatever. As long as it's a little bit to the right of five. And then where are you going to plug that in to kind of check? You're going to plug it into the X on the denominator. That's right. We're going to just see what happens to this. If we were to take five and take away 5.1, that would be, well, all we care about is that it's what, positive or negative? So Jose, mm -hmm. it would be what? It would be a negative, really small number. It would be a really small negative number, okay? I don't care that it, that it turns out being negative 0.1. I don't care about that because I know it's headed to zero. The closer and closer I get to five, right? The closer, the more, the more and more that I march towards five from the right, then I know that this number is gonna get smaller and smaller and smaller. I just needed to know if it's positive or negative. So we've determined it's negative, right? And so now, Jose, let's finish it up. You have fixed negative number over something headed to zero through negative numbers. Your answer would be what? Positive infinity. Positive infinity. Because the ratio, the ratio of two negatives would be positive. Got it? Good. Let's see. So next up is James. James, James, how are you doing, James? Hello, doing good. Good. Okay. So, so go ahead. We're going to start with so it's negative five on top. Okay. Over well, five minus negative or five plus negative five is zero. Okay, good. So right now, James, let me just ask you. Can you tell me, can you tell me the answer exactly right now, just by looking at that? Is, can, is that enough for you to tell me the answer? Um, yes, it would be, it would just be positive infinity. Okay, so I think you're already analyzing it. I, what I'm trying to do is, if all I ever gave you, like imagine we, we just walk into class and I tell you, we got a limit that's doing that. Is that enough? That would not be enough. That would not be enough. But you can narrow it down. At this point, you could tell me it's it's one of three things, right? Mm -hmm. It's either infinity, negative infinity, or, or doesn't exist, right? That's yes. what you can tell me. Okay. But we keep going. All right. We know we know now that this is, you said the top is negative five. So that's what fixed and negative on top. Mm -hmm. And then on the bottom, it's headed to zero. And you just got to figure out whether or not it's plus or minus. Yes. So what do I do now to figure out if that's plus or minus? What should I do? So we'll take a smaller number. Um, okay. and it's so I'll draw a number line, negative and, five. And a because, number on which side? Because it's uh, negative, it'll be coming from the left. Okay. And so you've got to give me a number over there. Um, Negative 5.0001. Did you say three zeros? Fine. That, that's yeah. good. Okay. So notice everyone, this is the part that gets people, like I said a minute ago, when you're in a negative side of the number line, right? You just got to be careful, right? You're, you're coming in over here, left side, negative 5.0001. Okay. What are you going to do with that, James? Um, we'll plug that in. Okay. To the bottom piece, right? Mm -hmm. So five, add to that um, negative 5.0001 and tell me what you're going to get here. Uh, we're just going to get a uh, negative 0 0.0001. That's right. So a very small negative number, mm -hmm. which now tells you what you had told me a second ago, that this, we weren't sure if it was zero positive or negative. Now we know it's negative, right? Mm -hmm. Negative so on top, negative on bottom. So it would be positive infinity. Infinity. Okay. 
So this is weird, right? Like these limits are weird because everything we've been doing up to this point has been some sort of algebra or some sort of trick. These don't work this way. This is just, again, it's more analyzing like what's going on, which means you have to understand numbers a little bit and how they work together. Number sense. All right, let's keep moving. So yeah, this is again where it doesn't really, the cases don't really matter. I mean, just see what's happening, right? Just see what's happening. Um, let's see who's up here. Pale, I think I'm saying that right. Yes, you did. Okay, all right. Are you following? Yes, I am. Okay, so tell me what happens if you do direct substitution here on this. What do we get on top? What do we get on bottom? On the top, you'll get 10, and on the bottom, you'll get zero. Okay, tell me what to write next. And now uh, you can write like fixed. Would it be a fixed positive? Yep, because 10 is a positive number, right? Okay, over zero. Mm -hmm. And then you write like the number line. Okay, good. And it's going to be approaching from the right. Okay, so give me a number here. Um, I guess like 5.1. Okay, and where are you plugging that at? You're gonna plug it into the bottom. So five minus 5.1, which, which would be? equals uh, negative 0.1. And all so, I care about is that it's negative, right? Yeah, so the zero is gonna be a negative. Uh, so you, you know that the answer is either positive infinity, negative infinity, or doesn't exist. That doesn't exist, okay? That doesn't exist is only going to come in when we have a two sided limit. That's the only time it's ever going to happen. So then it's going to be negative. I take that back. I take that back. Sorry. I can't say that. There are, there are functions where you can still have it not exist from just one side. Um, so I have to retract that. Sorry. Um, for this, does not exist isn't even an option because we have something happening here. We have it headed somewhere, right? Positive over negative. Go ahead. I'm going to let you finish. Oh, it's um, a negative infinity. Yep, we're done. Okay, I think we need to take a quick break here. Not break, but I, I want us to take a look. Let's take a look at x plus five over five minus x. I'm gonna go graph that like a function, okay? X plus five over five minus x. Let me see if I can find my graph. Yeah, this is it. Um, boom, 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 boom. I know you can't see it yet. Here it comes. All right. X minus, uh, wait a minute. What was it? X plus five over five minus X. And we were approaching five from which side? Or was it the right? Yes. Yeah, okay. So here's, here's what we got. This is actually the graph, okay? This right here is the graph of x plus five over five minus x. This is the graph of that function. And if we go to five, okay, on the x-axis, we go to five, you can see here we've got a problem because you can't plug five into this as a function, right? If it were a function, if I gave you this as a function, f of x equals x plus five over five minus x, f of five is undefined in terms of algebra, right? As an algebra question, it's undefined. But that's not what the, the calculus question was. What was the limit as we approach five from, from the right, right? And, and Halle said, Halle, Halle said negative infinity, right? That was our answer. Can you see from the graph that it's correct? If we just look at the graph as we approach five from the right, we're really only looking at this side of the graph. And as we approach five, here's five, from the right side, we're walking along the graph and look at where we're headed, down to negative infinity, right? It's diving down. That's what we just determined. Make sense or not? Now, if we came into five from the left side, right? If we came in from this side, well, then our answer should be positive infinity, but we would have to redo the limit, right? We'd have to go see what's happening. All right, let's continue. Next one, 
part B of this one. And we are on to Duck. No. You good? Yeah, yeah, I'm good. Okay. Tell me what we've got going on. So uh, I got 25 over zero. Over zero, okay. So that's fixed on top and positive, right? Yes. And then the bottom is headed to zero. We know that. So you just have to determine if it's positive or negative. Can you can you tell me what it is? Do you what duck, would the number line help you? Yes. Okay, let's do a number line then. And I would expect you to do a number line too. Like for a test problem, I, I like to see the number line. It shows me you're you're analyzing things. So I'm gonna put here negative five. Which side are you approaching? From the left. Left, okay, give me a number over here. Negative 5.01. Zero 01, good, okay. Now take that and figure out what's happening on the denominator here. The denominator would be a very small negative number. Very small negative number, which means that we're headed to zero through negatives, right? Yes. So what would our ratio give us as an answer? A negative infinity. Negative infinity, there we go. All right, making sense, everyone making sense? Okay, I'm gonna skip this one because this is basically the same problem. Just we get, I think we get a negative on top and a positive on the bottom. I wanna go to the next cases, E and F. So let's look at case E, this first one, part A. Limit X approaches five. Right, limit X approaches five. Now, um, Ash, you're up. Yes. Which side of five are we approaching? Apparently both. Both, right? Which means we have to look at it as two different problems, okay? Mm -hmm. But let's do direct substitution first, Ash. So okay. what would happen if we just approached five? What would we get? So on the top, we'll get 10, and on mm -hmm. the bottom, we'll get zero. Okay, so that's a fixed positive on top positive over zero, right? Okay, mm -hmm. but we don't know if it's positive or negative on the bottom yet, right? No, we don't. So here's where things get tricky because we have to approach five from both sides, meaning we have to go do these individually like two different problems and we have to make sure that the answers match. So let's do it this way. We know this is where we are, right? Let's break it off now into two different problems. First, let's approach five from the left, and then we'll approach five from the right. If that notation kind of makes sense, I'm gonna do two separate little ideas here. If we approach five from the left, let's see, our number line here would be five from the left. Ash, give me a number. Uh, 4.9. 4.9. And take that and go ahead and plug that in here and tell me what would happen. You'll get a small positive number. Okay, so now you can say that you had a fixed positive over a very small positive number, right? Mm -hmm. Which would give you what? Infinity. Infinity. So I'm running out of room there. Does everyone follow that? That's, that's approaching five from the left. We also have to approach from the right and see, that, see if we get the same thing. So now if we come into five from the right, Ashley, we keep going. Yep, okay. um, you'll get, uh, say, 5.1. 5.1, take that, try that in here now. Small negative number. Small negative number this time. So you have a fixed positive over a very small negative. That ratio would be what? Negative infinity. Okay, now, in order for the limit, for this original limit, in order for it to actually have an answer, we need the limit from both sides to be equal. And right now they are not, right? One of them is headed up, the other one's headed down. And so Ash, your answer would be? DNE. DNE does not exist, okay? The answer to the original thing would be DNE does not exist. That is our answer. So I'll have students that'll ask me, they'll be like, well, wait a minute. Okay, so if this is what happens, then can I just always say, oh, if it's not, if it's a two-sided limit, can I just say it does not exist? You know what I'm saying? 
Like, is that always the case? No, it's not. I'll give you an example in a minute. All right. Why don't you try, you try the next one. Okay. You try this one on your own. It's not like it's harder or anything like that, but see what, see what you get. I'll give you two minutes. I, I'll give you four minutes. I'm going to go refill my drink and I'll call on, I'm going to call on either Sophia or Red. Okay. Sophia, how'd that go? Um, I think I finished it. Okay. So which you're approaching negative five, right? Right. And, and because there's no uh, plus or minus, that means you have to do both sides, right? Yes. Okay. So let's see, what did you get? Cause you kind of, uh, I don't want to go through the whole problem like in detail, the top goes to 25, the bottom heads to zero. You have to take a look at two different scenarios, approaching negative five from the left and negative five from the right. So can you just tell me what you got in terms of infinities or whatever for approaching from the left? Um, from the left, I got negative infinity. Okay, and from the right? I got positive. Okay, does anybody disagree? Everyone's on board? So that would tell you, Sophia, that this limit what? Does not exist. Does not exist. Okay, I didn't show the detail because it's very similar to the last problem, all right? Okay, let's look at the this problem. This problem is different, okay? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with red on this one. You ready, red? Yeah. Okay, all right, so up to this point, Red, we have said that if you ever get fixed over zero, you've got three cases, right? And then we've had to kind of break it down by going in from you know, whichever side and figuring it out. For this one, I want you to just first do your direct substitution and tell me what's happening. So where's the top headed? Negative five. Okay, negative five. And where's the bottom headed? Zero. Zero, okay, so right now, it appears we're gonna to have to do the same thing, right? It appears maybe we are gonna to have to do the same thing, except Red realizes that you actually don't because you can always tell me what the denominator is gonna be right now in terms of positive or negative, right, Red? Yeah. From what? From the, um, I forget what it's called, but the exponent. <laughs> yeah, the squared, right? The squared. 
See, we know, we know that this inside here, we know that that's headed to zero, right? And yes, depending on which side of five we're coming in from, it might be a little small positive number. It might be a really small negative number, but it all doesn't matter because we're gonna wind up squaring it. And once we square it, it's positive. So we know right now that this is positive. There's no other thing we have to do, which means the top's headed to a fixed negative and the bottom's headed to zero through positive numbers. So red, what do we get? A negative infinity. There we go. You see? See that little subtle difference in this problem? That squared made our lives a lot easier. What if it had been cubed? What do you think, no? What if it was cubed? Wouldn't it just be, uh, well, it would be odd, so it wouldn't be guaranteed to be a That's right, positive it wouldn't be guaranteed, bottom. which means you'd have to go check it. You'd have to draw your number line, and you, in this case, you'd have to come in from both sides. And if, if this was odd, just to let you know, if this was odd, I'm just letting you know, this limit would not exist. Because when you did it from you know, the left side of five and the right side of five, you get infinity and negative infinity and they wouldn't match up. So you can only do that if that was an even number, okay? Questions? All right, I've got, let me see if we're ready for this one. Yeah, no, we're not ready for that. Okay, this one right here, this is basically the same story, all right? I'll move through this one quickly. So on this one, we let X go to three, the top heads to four, the bottom heads to zero. Now, I already know four is a positive number. Watch this, I'm not even gonna write fixed anymore. I'm just gonna throw a plus here because I know it's a positive number. And on the bottom, I know it's headed to zero, but the fourth power tells me it's positive also. And I already know that my, my three possibilities were infinity, negative infinity, or, zero, or does not exist. But in this case, they're both positive. So I'm at infinity and I'm done. All right, that's it. That's what um, infinite, infinite limits are about, all right? That's what they're about. They're about what happens when you have fixed on top, zero on the bottom. I think I wanna do one more. I think I wanna do one more. Um, let me add a page here. Uh, how about this one, limit? X goes to zero from the left of X. Let's go X plus three over sine X. Okay, we haven't seen this yet. This is new. This is new. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to let X go to zero, right? Like I do with all limits. When I let X go to zero, the top is headed to, Alec, you're up. One to three. Oh, three. Yeah. Yep. One, three. One to three. And then the bottom is headed to sine of zero, right? Which would be? When, isn't that one? No, that's or cosine. It, oh, then it's zero? Zero. Okay. So sine of zero is zero, right? All right. So right now, here's what we have. We have fixed positive on top and zero on the bottom. Now I need to figure out if it's positive or negative though. Everyone on board? Alec, you on board? Mm -hmm. So here's what we're, here, there's kind of two ways to do this problem. All right. I'm going to go with the way that I think is best, which is we are approaching zero from the left, right? And normally we've drawn a number line, right? That's what we've done. But this is the first time that our denominator is not something like, you know, X minus three or five minus X or something like that. Our denominator is actually a trig function. So instead of me drawing a number line, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to graph the sine function because I took pre-cal and I know what the sine function looks like, right? It goes like this and then it goes backwards like this, right? 
And what we're doing is we're approaching the value of zero. Here's zero on our graph, right? We already know that the sine function at zero is zero because that's Alec told us that sine of zero was zero. We know that already, but we're approaching zero from the left, which means we're over here on the sine function moving up towards this x-intercept and we are approaching zero through what, Alec? Positive or negative numbers? They're negative. Negative, right? Because the graph is below the x-axis, right? The graph of sine. So that means that we are approaching zero through negative numbers. So the ratio must be negative infinity, positive over negative. Do y'all see the difference between that one and the one before? I did not, like before I was just like analyzing, plugging the number in. Here I'm actually thinking about what the graph of the denominator looks like as I approach this number. Um, we could have done this, okay? Like we could have done this. If we go back to, let me see which one. Let me go back to one of these. Yeah. Um, like this one right here. This is what I kind of got y'all comfortable with. What I'm telling you right now is that if you wanted to, you could have taken this and graphed it. Now you need to know what X plus five looks like. You need to know what it looks like. So you need to know that this is a line that has a Y intercept of five and goes like this. Oh shit. That's what that's what X plus five or five plus X looks like. And it hits the X axis here at negative five. And we are approaching negative five from the left. So we would be coming into this graph from this side and those would be negative values. Which, was, which would match up with that. But I think that's harder, don't you? Like that's way more work for a problem like this one to do the graph. It's, I think it's a little more involved, so you don't need to. But if you get something that's, that's not so simple, right, to just plug the number in, then you may need to look at the graph to figure out what's going on. Okay, I'm gonna move on. We're not done with this idea yet. If you, if you um, think about what's going on here is every one of these graphs, what's happening is that as you're approaching a number from a certain side, you're having like an infinity or a negative infinity happen. That's what's happening, right? And if you think back to college algebra, that is the way, that is how we defined what were called vertical asymptotes in college algebra. When you're studying rational functions, you talk about these things called vertical asymptotes, where your graph goes up or down, right? That's basically what this is, okay? So a line, okay, a line x equals a, a vertical line, okay? Remember, x, x equals a number, x equals three, is a vertical line through three. So x equals a will be called a vertical asymptote of some function if any one of the following are true. If we approach that A from the left and get infinity, approach that A from the right, get infinity, approach that A from the left, get negative infinity, approach that A from the right, get negative infinity, approach A from both sides, get infinity, or approach A and get uh, both sides and get negative infinity. If any of those, any one of those things happens, we will call it a vertical asymptote of the function. All right. So let's, let's see how this would work within an example. Find, oh, and I'm going to abbreviate from here on out. I'm going to abbreviate vertical asymptote with VA just to make it easy. All right, find the VA of this function. So I give you a function. I'm asking you to tell me where the vertical asymptotes occur. All right. So what I'm going to do to do this is I'm going to factor it. I'm going to factor the numerator. I'm going to factor the denominator. Let's see, the denominator, I believe, factors would be x minus 4 times x minus 2. Okay. And I'm going to look at this, and I'm going to ask myself, I'm trying to find the vertical asymptote, so I'm really trying to figure out, is there anywhere where I get a fixed number on top and zero on the bottom? Can somebody tell me a place that that happens? X, well, 4. 
Okay, so Robert, think about this. At four, are you getting fixed over zero or are you getting zero over zero? At four. If I plug in four, won't I get zero on top and bottom? Right? You're right, yeah. So that's not gonna be fixed. Remember when I started this out in the very beginning, I said, when I say fixed over zero, I mean fixed meaning anything but zero. Because if we get zero over zero, it's a whole other ball game. When we get a fixed non-zero number over zero though, that's when we have these three possibilities. So back to this, Robert. Um, at four, right? At x equals four, we're getting something that looks like zero over zero, right? Which would be some sort of algebra we need to do. And really this is gonna to correspond to a hole in the graph. That's gonna be a hole. So four is not, we do not have a vertical asymptote at four. We need something fixed on top and zero on the bottom. So Robert, what, what other point do we have something interesting happening? At two. So wait, I put, sorry, I put X equals zero here. I apologize, everyone. That should say four. I think I, I, think I verbally said four, but wrote zero. Yes. Okay. Um, so where do we have something interesting, Robert? At two. At two. So at X equals two, right? What happens in the limit, I should say, as we let X approach two, on the top, what's the top headed to? If I let X go to two, let's see. Two, two minus four over. And then the bottom's headed to zero, right? <coughs> because of this factor right here. Yes. And then the top is headed to, what's that negative four on top? Because you do two times negative two. So you get negative four over zero and that's fixed over zero. And so right now I can tell you, I'm gonna have a vertical asymptote there because as I approach from different sides, I'm either gonna have like one side go up, one side go down, or maybe they'll both go up or maybe they'll both go down. But I can tell you something, some sort of vertical asymptote is gonna occur there. Does that make sense? If you have a function and you're trying to figure out where the top, where the top is fixed, but the bottom is not and it's headed to zero, right? I'm getting some weird looks on your faces. Let me give you another one. What about this? How about tangent x? Find the vertical asymptotes. So you probably, well, after maybe after I tell you, will remember that tangent has vertical asymptotes at like pi over two, negative pi over two, three pi over two. Y'all you know, remember what tangent looks like? Graph it, tan x. That's the graph of tangent. Look familiar? Pre-cal, okay. It has a bunch of vertical asymptotes, doesn't it? A bunch of vertical asymptotes. How could we figure out where they are? Well, what we do in a calculus class is we say, okay, well, let me look at this. This is sine over cosine, isn't it? Right. Sine over cosine. And now what we try and think about is, are there any values of X that are gonna cause this to be fixed over zero? Well, the only time we're ever gonna get zero is if the denominator is zero, right? So I wanna know when is that gonna be equal to zero? So when is cosine of X equal to zero? And this is where you can go to your unit circle and solve and get a general solution. So on the unit circle, cosine is the X coordinate, right? And the places that the X coordinate are zero are here and here, which would correspond to this angle here, which is pi over two. And then I could go this angle right here, which is three pi over two, right? That would be two answers, but there's actually an infinite number of them. And the way to write the infinite number of answers would be to, the way I would do it is say, okay, start at pi over two. That would be kind of our base point. If this X is equal to pi over two plus N pi. So, N is just like an arbitrary integer. It can be the number zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or negative one, negative two, negative three. 
And then pi is, is a half rotation. So this is basically saying start here, right? Start here and then add any number of half rotations. So if you start at pi over two, <clears throat> add one half rotation, you're here. Add two, you're here. Three, or you could go backwards and do the same thing. This is the infinite number of solutions. I have vertical asymptotes at all of these. Questions? Do you all also agree that when we're at these two points, these red points, do you agree that when we're at any of those two, either one, do you agree that the numerator is fixed? Because the numerator is sine, isn't it? And what is sine at either one of these? Fixed, right? It's, it's either one or negative one, right? So depending on which one we're at, we're either gonna get a fixed positive on top or a fixed negative on top. But that doesn't matter, the denominator is headed to zero. So we should get asymptotes here. You just have to be able to distinguish between a hole versus this situation, right? A hole is really just truly a hole in the graph. And then an asymptote is this thing, right? All right, how are y'all feeling? I cannot believe it's already 10 after, almost 10 after. All right. Okay, that's it, infinite limits, put that to rest. Move on to the second part of this section, limits at infinity. Make sure I can get to my notes here. All right, here we go, uh, limits at infinity. All right, so, so far, okay, so far what we've done, anytime we've done a limit up to this point, we have, we have let X approach A, right? And that A has always been a number. Let X approach zero, let X approach two, let X approach five, let X approach negative three, whatever. This A has always been a nice fixed number, right? And we approached it from you know, the left or the right. Sometimes we approached it from both, both sides. It just depended right, on what we were doing. Now what we're gonna do is we're going to switch it and we're gonna ask ourselves two different things. What does this mean and what does this mean? So instead of letting X approach a fixed number, A, we wanna know what happens when X goes to infinity or X goes to negative infinity. And here's the notation we'll use. So limit X goes to infinity of some function or limit as X goes to negative infinity of some function. These are completely different um, ideas than what we've been doing before because infinity is not a number, right? I taught my daughter when she was as old as, well, when she was young enough to understand just basic ideas of life, I, I taught her about infinity and I told her infinity is not a number. Infinity is not a number, right? Like this, there's this idea, you probably don't have this idea, maybe you do, but a lot of people think infinity is like, like the biggest number, right? It's, it's not, it, it's an idea. Infinity is a concept. It's the idea of something growing without bound, okay? So when we say X with an arrow pointed to infinity, we're saying what happens as X gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And when X, um, you know, with this arrow pointed to negative infinity, that means what happens when X gets bigger and bigger and bigger, but negative. So that's the first two main idea. The first main idea of, of this second part of this section is, you know, X with an arrow pointed to infinity means X is getting huge, larger and larger and larger positive, okay? X with an arrow pointed to negative infinity means X is getting really big, right? Huge, but negative. So I like to think about it this way, like an X axis, right? If this is zero, then X going to infinity means that we're headed that way forever, right? We're just headed to the right forever. And then X headed to negative infinity means that we're headed to the left forever. And what we're trying to figure out is like, as you move to the right forever, what is the function doing? As we move to the left forever, what is the function doing, right? Maybe as we go to the right, the function is getting closer to something. Maybe it's not, maybe it's moving around, who knows? But 
this is, this is the notation we're going to use to kind of study what happens at the left side and the right side of the function. You may recall this from college algebra. This is, had something to do with what we call the horizontal asymptotes. And we'll, we'll talk about that later. So you know how when I started today, I said like, this is the main idea. Fixed, fixed over zero gives you three possibilities, right? That was like the main concept from the first thing for the first part of the section. We do have another main concept for this one. Here's the main concept. If you're taking a limit, okay, and please remember this is in the limit, okay? If we're taking a limit and the numerator is fixed. Now fixed means, for us fixed means not zero, right? Right? If the, if the numerator is headed to a fixed number and notice I put here positive or negative, like I don't even care. I don't even care whether or not it's positive or negative. This is long as the numerator is headed to a fixed number and the denominator is headed to infinity. And again, I don't care if it's positive or negative. I have good news for you. Your answer is always zero. Okay. There's not three cases. We don't have to come in and check. Okay. If the top is kind of holding steady and the denominator blows up, that ratio becomes really, really small. Think about it like just pick some numbers. Imagine. Imagine you take a limit and the top is headed to five and then the bottom is headed to infinity. You can kind of think about like what, you know, what's happened, five over 10, five over a hundred, five over a thousand, five over, you know, just bigger and bigger numbers, right? Five over, and these numbers on the bottom just keep getting bigger and bigger. Each one of these, this is um, uh, 0.5, this is 0.05, this is 0 0.005. 0 0.0005. So what's happening here is these numbers are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Those numbers are headed to zero. So as the denominator grows without bound, the ratio goes to nothing. Does that seem like a reasonable concept to understand? There's, there's no left or right here. Because even if these were negative numbers, would it change anything? If let's say the bottom were all negatives down here, then these would just be negative, wouldn't they? but they're still getting really, really small and they're going to zero, aren't they? So it really doesn't matter, they're going to zero. So there's no, we don't care about the sign. Also, if the top was, you know, if the top was negative, it wouldn't change anything, right? That, so the signs don't matter anymore for this type of problem. Okay. Um, I wanna bring up, there's that limit summary sheet, that limit summary sheet that's provided in Canvas for you. I wanna kind of like, just let's start it, let's look at it like we've never seen it before, okay? And let's just talk about what we know how to do right now. We know when we get zero over zero, that's bad, right? There's algebra, there's some sort of trick we have to do for that, right? So we got that. All right, the first part of this section dealt with the bottom left corner of this. Fixed positive over zero positive infinity. Fixed negative over zero negative infinity. And then the other two possibilities, right? We, that we've covered, right? That we covered. What this second section is about, this next part, is this. And you know what? This should have plus or minus here. I don't know why I left it off. That should have plus or minus. So if our numerator is fixed, doesn't matter if it's positive or negative, and our denominator is headed to infinity, we will always get zero, okay? Let's just do a quick example. Limit, x goes to infinity, one over x squared. So what I'm gonna do here, is I'm going to ask, I think it's Devin, right? Devin? Yeah. Not, yeah. yeah. Okay. Devin. Yeah. All right. So what's the numerator headed to? It'd be one, right? Or one, no, right? Um, sorry. Yeah, no, you're right. One, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because it's not really headed anywhere. It is one, isn't it? <laughs> like it is the yeah. number one, which is fixed, right? So you can tell me that's fixed on top and positive. Now, where's the denominator headed? 
It would be infinity, right? Right, infinity, right? Because infinity squared would still be infinite, right? That's still a huge number. It's even bigger than infinity just by itself because you're squaring it, but it's infinity. So it's it's hard to say. Is infinity squared bigger than infinity? Um, I don't think so because it's not a number, right? That's right. It's not a number. This, this doesn't make any sense. You can't you can't treat infinity this way. Okay, you can't because yeah, it's not a fixed number. So you just can't, right? That's, that doesn't make any sense. All right, but what we can say is that the bottom is headed to infinity, right? It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And once we know that, right, right, Devin, once we know that, we know the answer. What's the answer? It would be zero, right? Zero, right? Okay. Now, I'm just curious, Devin. Mm -hmm. you, you have two ways of, of understanding this. The first way you could understand this is just say, Oh, anytime I see fixed over infinity, I get zero because um, I was told if I look at this chart, the answer is zero. That's one way to do it. Not even to not even think about what's happening. Just be like, oh, the answer is zero. That's one way to look at it. The other way to think about it, which I think is way more useful to you moving on, is to be thinking about a number on top like one. Right. That's the number one. And what happens to it when you divide it by bigger and bigger and bigger numbers and to understand that that ratio Get smaller and smaller and smaller. That's the way I I would prefer you understand it. All right, it's more beneficial. Uh, let me keep, let me do another one. How about this? Limit x goes to um, infinity. How about one over x to the to the um, nth power? This is a trick question. Hmm. What's tricky about this question is this. If we, if we just figure out what's going on, on here, right? We're gonna have one on top, right? Which is fixed, right? The bottom is headed to infinity to the nth power. Now in the previous problem, infinity squared we agreed would be infinite, right? Is infinity to the nth power always going to be infinity? Uh, it wouldn't be at zero, right? Yeah, what if n was zero? What's anything to the zero power? One. One. So this would not work. We could not say this. We could not say that this is one over infinity. We could not do this, right? No, not if n was zero. Any other n's that wouldn't work? What if n was negative one? What would that really mean? What if you have a negative exponent in the denominator of a fraction, right? Like what if I wrote a fraction one over five to the negative one? What if I wrote that? What does that really mean? Isn't it, I, I might be That's wrong, five. but isn't it like one over five or five over well, yeah, one? Yeah, you could write that as one over one over five. You could do that. And then you can just flip it because you have one over a fraction that the reciprocal of that's just five. Yeah. Right? So imagine this, if this n was negative, it would actually bring that infinity up to the numerator, right? And now you don't have fixed over infinity anymore. You have infinity on top, which is not good. So we need to eliminate the possibility that n is negative and eliminate n from being zero. So not if this is that or negative one or negative two or negative three, if any of that, it's not gonna work. So let me write it this way. The limit as X goes to infinity of one over X to the N will be equal to zero if N is greater than or equal to one. So as long as N is a positive number bigger than one, we should be okay. Because then you don't have this zero power, which turns it into a one. You don't have the negatives, which pushes it to the top. This is in your notes, okay? I have it here. Where is it? Where is it? Oh, right here. 
I put if n is any positive integer, one, two, three, four, then uh, limit x goes to infinity, one over x to the n equals zero. And it also works if you go to negative infinity. So if you go out, you know, make x get really big positive or big negative, you still get zero as a ratio. So that is in your notes. Okay, you ready? We have 20 minutes. Now we get to do some interesting problems. You got the basic idea for this part, right? Fixed over infinity heads to zero. Doesn't matter what the signs are. Let's do this. Oh, I should also, before I do this, I need to point something else out. No, you know what? We'll do it while we're doing this. We'll do it while we're doing this one. I'll, I'll tackle it as we get to it. All right, so who's up here? Uh, Enrique. Enrique, you there? I don't see Enrique. All right, David? Yeah. All right, David. So I want you to I want you to do like direct substitution like we've been doing, okay? But you're plugging in infinity and you have to remember infinity is an idea, all right? Okay. So as I start to plug infinity in to this x right here, if I square that, what would I get? Uh, infinity. Infinity, right? Okay. Yeah, infinity. So infinity squared, infinity. And then multiply that times three. Is this still going to be infinity? Still infinite, right? <laughs> okay, so here's what we got. We've got something that's infinite. And now we're going to add to that. That's plus. Now, two times infinity would be? Infinity again. Infinity, okay. And then we're going to subtract from that five. Five. Which will have no impact on it, right? Because you're taking five away from something that's getting infinitely big. So I, I'm not even going to consider that. Right? Okay. Yeah. Does everyone see that? Like taking five away from this huge number makes no difference. It's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. All right. So David, let's keep going. What about the denominator? Be careful here. You're going to take infinity and you're going to square it, right? Yeah. And so you get infinity squared and then times negative four. So is it going to be negative infinity? Negative infinity. Yeah. It's a huge negative number. And then you're adding seven. Do you think that has any, really any impact no. on it? No. No. Okay. So let's keep going. On the top, you're taking infinity and you're adding infinity. Two infinities added together should be what, David? Infinity. Uh, again. Infinity. Yeah. Yeah. And then that's divided by a negative. negative infinity. All right. Now, you might be tempted... Okay, you might be tempted at this class at, at this time to say that the answer is negative one. Infinity. Yeah. You might you might be because you, you may be like, oh, well, just like the infinities cancel and you get one over negative one, and your answer is negative one. This is incorrect. All right. The reason it's incorrect is because again, this is an idea. What we're saying yeah. with this is that the numerator is getting huge, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And the denominator is getting huge as well, but it's always negative. You don't know from looking at this which one is getting bigger faster, or if they're both kind of getting big at the same rate. This is this scenario right here. This scenario right here for us is an unknown. Like we don't know what's happening here. And we've seen this before. We've seen this here when we get zero over zero it's undefined notice the the thing that's right next to it y'all see what's right next to it we haven't talked about that one have we until right now now we have seen we are seeing this for the first time we're getting an infinity over an infinity forget the signs forget that there's a positive or negative just agree with me that we are getting something that like this i'll just pull the negative out we get infinity over infinity right and our question yeah. is, what in the heck does that do or what does it mean, all right? So from here on out, when we see this infinity over infinity, we're going to treat it exactly the way we did with the zero over zero. And we're going to say bad. And we're going to say we need some algebra or some trick, all right? 
Yes. So we, we're kind of back to what we were doing before. We need to do some algebra here, all right? The question is, what algebra? Because this doesn't factor. And if you go back and you look at when we got zero over zero, right, in this class earlier, when we were getting zero over zero, what we were doing was factoring or conjugate or some weird combining of fractions, common denominator. And we were trying to get factors to cancel. Remember that? We were trying to get this zero on the bottom to go away. That was kind of our goal. This algebra that we're going to use for this is different. All right, you ready for it? I'm about to do it. But I just want to make sure everyone's clear that, that when we're at this step right here, we don't know, right? This is bad. Algebra. Trick. Is it the same dead or no? Is uh, it the same what? Like x squared and x squared, and then it becomes the same. Or well, because like they're both x squared, they, yeah. they look like, yeah. So a good idea here would be, a, look, they're, they're probably growing about the same because they're both squared, Yeah. right? Okay, but how do we get to it, right? So here we go. Limit, I'm going to rewrite the problem. 3x squared, I'm, I'm leaving a space out here for a reason. 3x squared plus 2x minus 5 over negative four X squared plus seven. Okay. So I'm about to do something here algebraically that we have not done in this class before, right? This is the first time we, we are in this class gonna do this. You may have done this in algebra, that's fine. If you didn't, that's fine. I'm gonna do it and then we're gonna talk about why I'm doing it because the why is more important than, than me doing it, okay? I'm going to be clever. I'm gonna multiply this whole thing out front by one, okay? By the number one, which shouldn't change anything, right? If I multiply by one, nothing changes. But the one that I'm gonna pick is gonna be super, super clever. Watch, I'm gonna multiply by one over X squared by one over X squared. Don't ask me why yet, okay? Don't ask me why I did that. Just let's do it, okay? When I multiply that, that means I must distribute it through to those terms. Like I said, ignore the Y for right now. Uh, let's see, David, we got Leonard. Haven't heard from Leonard today. Hello. How's it going? Pretty good. Good. Help me distribute this through. What would you get when you multiply here to here? Uh, the numerator over x squared, right? Mm -hmm. And on the denominator over x squared as well. So, oh, but then you yeah. cross out the x squared. So you just get? Uh, just the numerator without the x squared. And then so the three. denominator. Right? You just get three there? Uh-huh. Right, I'll do that one. I'll do that one over here. We're doing one over x squared times three x squared. So basically you get three X squared over X squared. The X squareds cancel, you just get three. Yeah. Okay. Now, when you do the second one like this, same story, but all of the X's don't go away this time, right? No. So you have a plus, you have this X goes away on top and on the bottom, only one of the X's goes away. So you're left with what? Two over X. Two over X, good. And then minus, now the last one, x squared. five over x squared. Everyone clear on that? That's what happened up top. On the bottom, same story, here to here, here to here, right? First one, I'm gonna get negative four. Second one, I'm gonna get seven over x squared. Any questions on that algebra? Okay. Why did I do that? Why did I do that? Take the limit now. Let X go to infinity now. Okay, uh, let me see. 
Shams, I haven't heard from you today. How are you doing, Sham? You there? You there? Shams, Shams, no Shams. Okay. Landon. Landon. Yes, sir. Okay. Can you tell why I did that? Can you see if you let X go to infinity, what's going to happen? If uh... let me let me ask you to look at this right here. Oh, okay. If X goes to infinity on that, what do you have up top? Um, it would be the the numerator is what? The numerator. It is uh if it's going towards infinity, is it a fixed? No, it's not a fixed number. Yeah, it's it's fixed uh, on top. Hold on. It's fixed oh, on top and the bottom's headed where? The bottom is heading towards is also a fixed number as well. Hmm. No. The top, or... the top is two. It's fixed, right? Yes. The bottom is headed to where's X going? To uh, in positive infinity. Okay. Fixed over infinity always goes to. Always goes to. A sm uh, smaller, uh, the smallest number, a small positive number. I, I, I can't agree with that completely. Small positive number. This was the thing we all agreed upon just now, right? If we ever have, or I should say, we said on um, what one step back, where was it? The big idea here, fixed number over infinity, doesn't matter what the signs are, this always goes to zero. That's oh, okay. the big takeaway, okay. right? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so this two over X is fixed over infinity, right? Yes, it is. So that heads to what? It heads towards zero. Okay, look at this next piece over here, five over X squared. Yes, five over X. Head? That is a fixed number as well. Over infinity it's, squared, right? Yes, so, five over infinity squared, yes. So that heads to zero, right? Yes. And so does this one, right? Yes. Everyone see that? So the only thing left is this and this. So my answer would be three, four, three over negative four. That's my answer. That's what it's headed to. Now, I had to come in here. I had to come in here with the one over x squared. Can somebody help me explain why I picked one over x squared? What was the determining factor for that? You would knew that it would cancel out some of the x's while leaving the numerators alone. OK, so I was trying to figure out what would cancel x's out, right? But I didn't want to kill everything. Look, what if I would have done, let me take this real quick. What if I would have done this? What if I would have done, instead of one over X squared, one over X squared, what if I would have done one over X cubed, one over X cubed, what would have happened? Here, here, and here. So I would have got here, three over X, right? The next one would have been two over X squared. And the next one would have been, oops, minus five over X cubed. And then the bottom one would have been distribute here to here, negative four over X. And then distribute here to here, you would have got positive seven over X cubed. What's wrong with this? What's wrong with doing it this way? It's all zeros. They're all zeros, right? They're all zeros. So what are you going to get on top? Zero over zero and that's bad you don't know what's going on right so it's like you killed everything and that got you nowhere so basically what you try to do by putting one over x squared you try to get up the coefficient to cancel out exactly i want to leave the coefficient right nico but the coefficient of what what am i really what do i really care about what i really care about um let me uh yeah let me just erase this what I really care about, let me go back to the original problem. What I really care about is this. I don't care in the numerator. I don't care if I get a zero. 
Okay, I do not care in the numerator if I ever get a zero because zero on top is not a problem. The problem is getting a zero on the bottom. So what I'm really concerned about, is there a way that I can somehow conserve the number in front of the X squared? If I can leave the negative four there and make sure it never goes away, then I'm guaranteed that I'm not gonna get division by zero. So that then I look at the power of X here and that's what I come in with, one over X squared, one over X squared. That's why I picked it. So the rule of thumb is this, you look at the denominator and you look at its highest power of X and that's what you're gonna multiply by one over that, okay? If you took college algebra and you learned this, they, they might've told you to do that. Just look at the denominator with the highest power of X. That's what you multiply top and bottom by. But I hope now you see why. It has to do with the idea of this limit and wanting to somehow preserve this coefficient. All right, I'm almost out of time. We don't have enough time to do another problem. So for 1.6 homework, you can't really technically do it all right now. Um, And there's so many of these that go to infinity. That sucks. Yeah, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, so here's what I would do for homework for one six. For one six. Let's do just this. Don't ignore this assignment for now because there's still more we need to do in this section. For, for one six, do problems 13 through, I'm gonna see how you do 13 through 20. But I'll tell you right now that problems 18, 19 and 20 are problems like I just did. So I've only given you one example of it. So just see how they go. The others have to do with what we did earlier today. All right, um, is there anything that's supposed to be due today or um, before class next time? No handwritten homework, right? No, I believe the next one's uh, February 7th, I think, yeah. something like that. February 7th, correct, yeah. So. Um, yeah, nothing new. So just make sure you, you take a look at those problems. Make sure you finish all your other homework if you haven't already done so. Any questions? Okay. All right. Thank you again for your attention and cameras on and all that. I appreciate it. And I will see you on Thursday. Thank you. See you Thursday. Okay. Have a good one. Thursday, um, sir. Actually, Thank you. I, I did have one question. Sure. Yeah. Uh, for uh, before we go through the exam uh, next week, will we go over again the procedures for doing the exam? Just it's, it's a little different than I've done it in other courses. Yes, we'll go through it again. Um, the, let me see here. I think this. I think the syllabus has it. The procedure which you can read through um, and then I'll discuss it more if it's still confusing because I know people will be a little bit confused about it. Um, exam policy, yeah. So this is pretty much lays it out, okay? Like when class starts, I'll email you the exam. Once you receive the exam, you have a certain amount of time to hand copy the exam or print it. So it's probably gonna be like 10, 15 minutes. And then after you've copied or printed it, you'll begin working on the paper, working on the exam. And then, yeah, I go, I go through this, but I will clarify okay. it all before probably um, Thursday at, at the end of class. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. That's it. Thank you, Professor. What date was the exam going to be on? Pardon me? What date was the exam going to be on? February 10th. So that, I believe, is next Thursday. Yes, next Thursday. And it's gonna be over like 1.3 to what we do this week? I think it's gonna be everything through one six is what it's looking like. So everything we've done up through one six. So mostly 
you know, one, one and one, two were just review. So I wouldn't anticipate much from there. Um, that doesn't mean that, I, you know, it's fair, it's fair game for me to pull a problem from these sections, but uh, really emphasizing one, three, one, four. Remember one, five, we skipped, right? So one, five is actually, we're gonna do that after one, six. So it's really looking like one, three, one, four, one, six is all that's gonna be on the exam. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay.